the pride of the village. May no wolf howl, no screech owl stir a wing about thy sepulchre, no boisterous winds or storms come hither to starve or wither thy soft sweet earth. But, like a spring, love kept it ever flourishing. Herrick In the course of an excursion through one of the remote counties of England, I had struck into one of those crossroads that lead through the more secluded parts of the country, and stopped one afternoon at a village, the situation of which was beautifully rural and retired. There was an air of primitive simplicity about its inhabitants not to be found in the villages which lie on the great coach roads. I determined to pass the night there, and, having taken an early dinner, strolled out to enjoy the neighboring scenery. My ramble, as is usually the case with travelers, soon led me to the church, which stood at a little distance from the village. Indeed, it was an object of some curiosity, its old tower being completely overrun with ivy, so that only here and there a jutting buttress, an angle of gray wall, or a fantastically carved ornament peered through the verdant covering. It was a lovely evening. The early part of the day had been dark and showery, but in the afternoon it had cleared up, and, though sullen clouds still hung overhead, yet there was a broad tract of golden sky in the west, from which the setting sun gleamed through the dripping leaves and lit up all nature into a melancholy smile. It seemed like the parting hour of a good Christian smiling on the sins and sorrows of the world, and giving, in the serenity of his decline, an assurance that he will rise again in glory. I had seated myself on a half-sunken tombstone, and was musing, as one is apt to do at this sober-thoughted hour, on past scenes and early friends on those who were distant and those who were dead, and indulging in that kind of melancholy fancying which has in it something sweeter even than pleasure. Every now and then the stroke of a bell from the neighboring tower fell on my ear. Its tones were in unison with the scene, and, instead of jarring, chimed in with my feelings and it was some time before I recollected that it must be tolling the knell of some new tenant of the tomb. Presently I saw a funeral train moving across the village green. It wound slowly along a lane, was lost, and reappeared through the breaks of the hedges until it passed the place where I was sitting. The pall was supported by young girls dressed in white and another, about the age of seventeen, walked before, bearing a chaplet of white flowers, a token that the deceased was a young and unmarried female. The corpse was followed by the parents. They were a venerable couple of the better order of peasantry. The father seemed to repress his feelings, but his fixed eye contracted brow, and deeply furrowed face showed the struggle that was passing within. His wife hung on his arm and wept aloud with the convulsive bursts of a mother's sorrow. I followed the funeral into the church. The bier was placed in the center aisle, and the chaplet of white flowers with a pair of white gloves was hung over the seat which the deceased had occupied. Everyone knows the soul-subduing pathos of the funeral service, for who is so fortunate as never to have followed someone he has loved to the tomb? But when performed over the remains of innocence and beauty, thus laid low in the bloom of existence, 
what can be more affecting? At that simple but most solemn consignment of the body to the grave, earth to earth, ashes to ashes, dust to dust, the tears of the youthful companions of the deceased flowed unrestrained. The father still seemed to struggle with his feelings, and to comfort himself with the assurance that the dead are blessed which die in the Lord. But the mother only thought of her child as a flower of the field cut down and withered in the midst of its sweetness. She was like Rachel, mourning over her children, and would not be comforted. On returning to the inn, I learnt the whole story of the deceased. It was a simple one, and such as has often been told. She had been the beauty and pride of the village. Her father had once been an opulent farmer, but was reduced in circumstances. This was an only child, and brought up entirely at home in the simplicity of rural life. She had been the pupil of the village pastor, the favorite lamb of his little flock. The good man watched over her education with paternal care. It was limited and suitable to the sphere in which she was to move, for he only sought to make her an ornament to her station in life, not to raise her above it. The tenderness and indulgence of her parents and the exemption from all ordinary occupations, had fostered a natural grace and delicacy of character that accorded with the fragile loveliness of her form. She appeared like some tender plant of the garden, blooming accidentally amid the hardier natives of the fields. The superiority of her charms was felt and acknowledged by her companions, but without envy, for it was surpassed by the unassuming gentleness and winning kindness of her manners. It might be truly said of her, This is the prettiest low-born lass that ever ran on the green sward. Nothing she does or seems but smacks of something greater than herself. Too noble for this place. The village was one of those sequestered spots which still retained some vestiges of old English customs. It had its rural festivals and holiday pastimes, and still kept up some faint observance of the once popular rites of May. These, indeed, had been promoted by its present pastor, who was a lover of old customs, and one of those simple Christians that think their mission fulfilled by promoting joy on earth and good will among mankind. Under his auspices the maypole stood from year to year in the center of the village green. On May Day it was decorated with garlands and streamers, and a queen or lady of the May was appointed as in former times, to preside at the sports and distribute the prizes and rewards. The picturesque situation of the village and the fancifulness of its rustic fights would often attract the notice of casual visitors. Among these, on one May Day, was a young officer whose regiment had been recently quartered in the neighborhood. He was charmed with the native taste that pervaded this village pageant, but, above all, with the dawning loveliness of the Queen of May. It was the village favorite who was crowned with flowers and blushing and smiling in all the beautiful confusion of girlish diffidence and delight. The artlessness of rural habits enabled him readily to make her acquaintance, he gradually won his way into her intimacy, and paid his court to her in that unthinking way in which young officers are too apt to trifle with rustic simplicity. There was nothing in his advances to startle or alarm. He never even talked of love. But there are modes of making it more eloquent than language, 
and which convey it subtly and irresistibly to the heart. The beam of the eye, the tone of voice, the thousand tendernesses which emanate from every word and look and action, these form the true eloquence of love, and can always be felt and understood, but never described. Can we wonder that they should readily win a heart young, guileless, and susceptible? As to her, she loved almost unconsciously. She scarcely inquired what was the growing passion that was absorbing every thought and feeling, or what were to be its consequences. She, indeed, looked not to the future, when present, his looks and words occupied her whole attention. When absent, she thought but of what had passed at their recent interview. She would wander with him through the green lanes and rural scenes of the vicinity. He taught her to see new beauties in nature. He talked in the language of polite and cultivated life and breathed into her ear the witcheries of romance and poetry. Perhaps there could not have been a passion between the sexes more pure than this innocent girl's. The gallant figure of her youthful admirer and the splendor of his military attire might at first have charmed her eye, but it was not these that had captivated her heart. Her attachment had something in it of idolatry. She looked up to him as to a being of a superior order. She felt in his society the enthusiasm of a mind naturally delicate and poetical, and now first awakened to a keen perception of the beautiful and grand. Of the sordid distinctions of rank and fortune she thought nothing. It was the difference of intellect, of demeanor, of manners, from those of the rustic society to which she had been accustomed, that elevated him in her opinion. She would listen to him with charmed ear and downcast look of mute delight, and her cheek would mantle with enthusiasm or if ever she ventured a shy glance of timid admiration, it was as quickly withdrawn, and she would sigh and blush at the idea of her comparative unworthiness. Her lover was equally impassioned, but his passion was mingled with feelings of a coarser nature. He had begun the connection in levity, for he had often heard his brother officers boast of their village conquests, and thought some triumph of the kind necessary to his reputation as a man of spirit. But he was too full of youthful fervor. His heart had not yet been rendered sufficiently cold and selfish by a wandering and dissipated life. It caught fire from the very flame it sought to kindle, and before he was aware of the nature of his situation, he became really in love. What was he to do? There were the old obstacles which so incessantly occur in these heedless attachments. His rank in life, the prejudices of titled connections, his dependence upon a proud and unyielding father, all forbade him to think of matrimony. But when he looked down upon this innocent being, so tender and confiding, there was a purity in her manners, a blamelessness in her life, and a beseeching modesty in her looks that awed down every licentious feeling in vain did he try to fortify himself by a thousand heartless examples of men of fashion 
and to chill the glow of generous sentiment with that cold derisive levity with which he had heard them talk of female virtue whenever he came into her presence she was still surrounded by that mysterious but impassive charm of virgin purity in whose hallowed sphere no guilty thought can live the sudden arrival of orders from the regiment to repair to the continent completed the confusion of his mind he remained for a short time in a state of the most painful irresolution he hesitated to communicate the tidings until the day for marching was at hand when he gave her the intelligence in the course of an evening ramble the idea of parting had never before occurred to her it broke in at once upon her dream of felicity she looked upon it as a sudden and insurmountable evil and wept with the guileless simplicity of a child he drew her to his bosom and kissed the tears from her soft cheek nor did he meet with a repulse for there are moments of mingled sorrow and tenderness which hallow the caresses of affection he was naturally impetuous and the sight of beauty apparently yielding in his arms the confidence of his power over her and the dread of losing her forever all conspired to overwhelm his better feelings he ventured to propose that she should leave her home and be the companion of his fortunes he was quite a novice in seduction and blushed and faltered at his own baseness but so innocent of mind was his intended victim that she was at first at a loss to comprehend his meaning and why she should leave her native village and the humble roof of her parents when at last the nature of his proposal flashed upon her pure mind the effect was withering she did not weep she did not break forth into reproach she said not a word but she shrunk back aghast as from a viper gave him a look of anguish that pierced to his very soul and clasping her hands in agony fled as if for refuge to her father's cottage the officer retired confounded humiliated and repentant it is uncertain what might have been the result of the conflict of his feelings had not his thoughts been diverted by the bustle of departure new scenes new pleasures and new companions soon dissipated his self-reproach and stifled his tenderness yet amidst the stir of camps the revelries of garrisons the array of armies and even the din of battles his thoughts would sometimes steal back to the scenes of rural quiet and village simplicity the white cottage the footpath along the silver brook and up the hawthorn edge and the little village maid loitering along it leaning on his arm and listening to him with eyes beaming with unconscious affection the shock which the poor girl had received in the destruction of all her ideal world had indeed been cruel faintings and hysterics had at first shaken her tender frame and were succeeded by a settled and pining melancholy she had beheld from her window the march of the departing troops she had seen her faithless lover borne off as if in triumph amidst the sound of drum and trumpet and the pomp of arms she strained a last aching gaze after him as the morning sun glittered about his figure and his plume waved in the breeze he passed away like a bright vision from her sight and left her all in darkness it would be trite to dwell on the particulars of her after story it was 
like other tales of love, melancholy. She avoided society and wandered out alone in the walks she had most frequented with her lover. She sought, like the stricken deer, to weep in silence and loneliness and brood over the barbed sorrow that rankled in her soul. Sometimes she would be seen late of an evening sitting in the porch of the village church, and the milkmaids returning from the fields would now and then overhear her singing some plaintive ditty in the hawthorn walk. She became fervent in her devotions at church, and as the old people saw her approach so wasted away, yet with a hectic gloom and that hallowed air which melancholy diffuses round the form, they would make way for her as for something spiritual, and looking after her would shake their heads in gloomy foreboding. She felt a conviction that she was hastening to the tomb, but looked forward to it as a place of rest. The silver cord that had bound her to existence was loosed, and there seemed to be no more pleasure under the sun. If ever her gentle bosom had entertained resentment against her lover, it was extinguished. She was incapable of angry passions, and in a moment of saddened tenderness she penned him a farewell letter. It was couched in the simplest language, but touching from its very simplicity. She told him that she was dying, and did not conceal from him that his conduct was the cause. She even depicted the sufferings which she had experienced, but concluded with saying that she could not die in peace until she had sent him her forgiveness, and her blessing. By degrees her strength declined that she could no longer leave the cottage. She could only totter to the window where, propped up in her chair, it was her enjoyment to sit all day and look out upon the landscape. Still she uttered no complaint nor imparted to any one the malady that was preying on her heart. She never even mentioned her lover's name, but would lay her head on her mother's bosom and weep in silence. Her poor parents hung in mute anxiety over this fading blossom of their hopes, still flattering themselves that it might again revive to freshness and that the bright unearthly bloom which sometimes flushed her cheek might be the promise of returning health. In this way she was seated between them one Sunday afternoon. Her hands were clasped in theirs. The lattice was thrown open, and the soft air that stole in brought with it the fragrance of the clustering honeysuckle which her own hands had trained round the window. Her father had just been reading a chapter in the Bible. It spoke of the vanity of worldly things and of the joys of heaven. It seemed to have diffused comfort and serenity through her bosom. Her eye was fixed on the distant village church. The bell had tolled for the evening service. The last villager was lagging into the porch and everything had sunk into that hallowed stillness peculiar to the day of rest. Her parents were gazing on her with yearning hearts. Sickness and sorrow, which passed so roughly over some faces, had given to hers the expression of a seraph's. A tear trembled in her soft blue eye, was she thinking of her faithless lover? Or were her thoughts wandering to that distant churchyard into whose bosom she might soon be gathered? Suddenly the clang of hoofs was heard. A horseman galloped to the cottage. He dismounted before the window, 
the poor girl gave a faint exclamation and sunk back in her chair. It was her repentant lover. He rushed into the house and flew to clasp her to his bosom, but her wasted form, her death-like countenance, so wan yet so lovely in its desolation, smote him to the soul, and he threw himself in agony at her feet. She was too faint to rise. She attempted to extend her trembling hand. Her lips moved as if she spoke, but no word was articulated. She looked down upon him with a smile of unutterable tenderness and closed her eyes forever. Such are the particulars which I gathered of this village story. They are but scanty, and I am conscious have little novelty to recommend them. In the present rage also for strange incident and high-seasoned narrative, they may appear trite and insignificant, but they interested me strongly at the time, and, taken in connection with the affecting ceremony which I had just witnessed, left a deeper impression on my mind than many circumstances of a more striking nature. I have passed through the place since, and visited the church again from a better motive than mere curiosity. It was a wintry evening, the trees were stripped of their foliage, the churchyard looked naked and mournful, and the wind rustled coldly through the dry grass. Evergreens, however, had been planted about the grave of the village favorite, and osiers were bent over it to keep the turf uninjured. The church door was open, and I stepped in, there hung the chaplet of flowers and the gloves, as on the day of the funeral. The flowers were withered, it is true, but care seemed to have been taken that no dust should soil their whiteness. I have seen many monuments where art has exhausted its powers to awaken the sympathy of the spectator, but I have met with none that spoke more touchingly to my heart than this simple but delicate memento of departed innocence. <laughs>